I think it's time to start. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending um, this wonderful Green Energy Series on this wonderful Saturday morning. We give these Green Energy Series on the first Saturday of every month. Um, these Green Energy Series talks um, dive uh, into topics that are deeper than you would traditionally find in the Gold Solar uh, webinar. And um, these webinars are going to be recorded um, so that they're available for others to see on YouTube um, after this talk. Um, and uh, they're presented by Solar Oregon. So Solar Oregon is a Oregon nonprofit. It's been around for 36 years. Um, its mission is to do education, outreach, and community advocacy. Uh, one of the hallmarks of Solar Oregon is uh, their education series, How to Go Solar, um, which gives people a great introduction on how to go solar. Uh, we also do uh, solar tours um, of various uh, projects around the state that uh, have gone solar. Uh, we've, we do solarized campaigns and we do peer-to-peer -peer education uh, through uh, means such as this one in this talk. And there's a picture of uh, from the solar winery tour. And uh, there'll be more of those solar winery tours in the future. So stay tuned if you would like to drink wine and visit solar uh, projects. <laughs> and uh, so another upcoming event to put on your radar is uh, a tour and showcase of the uh, Winey Watts Commons. And this is a uh, senior multifamily um, construction project that was recently completed. Uh, the tour will be on Tuesday, February 7th at 5 p.m. Uh, so uh, look in your emails and look in Eventbrite uh, for this event. And uh, if you like the, the, this talk or other things that Solar Oregon does, um, feel free to donate uh, with this link. Um, we are a nonprofit, so uh, you know, most of the work is done by volunteers, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the cost of operating Solar Oregon is still not free. So, uh, you know, some uh, funding would be appreciated. And so throughout this talk, feel free to use the Q&A uh, or the chat uh, to ask questions. And... Uh, we would like to know, you know, where our audience, you know, uh, is coming from. Uh, Carrie, if you would like to launch this survey or able to launch a survey, uh, we can find out, you know, where our uh, participants are coming from. So, Edward, I f we forgot that we discussed not having surveys, and so I think okay, took we'll them move out. Then. Took them out. Keep moving. Thank you. All right, um, and then. Carrie, we also got a Q&A that the chat is disabled. Okay, so in that case, uh, then we'll, if participants, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A then. And so anyways, uh, my name is Edward Louie. I work at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and uh, I'm also a, a board member of Solar Oregon. And uh, at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, I work on uh, projects related to heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, high performance windows, and also consult on uh, advanced uh, building envelope uh, assemblies. And then outside of work, I'm working on finishing the inside to a uh, super energy efficient off-grid uh, beyond net zero energy uh, tiny house. And so uh, something I wanna let you know is that um, the views of this presentation does not necessarily represent any of anything from my workplace, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, or to the U.S. Department of Energy, or necessarily Solar Oregon, uh, but I have made you know my best effort to convey uh, information accurately. And so the topic of this presentation is utility scale solar. And so with this presentation, we'll go over the types of utility scale solar. Uh, we'll also talk about the value of energy. Um, it is not as simple as you think it is. Uh, we'll talk about how um, solar, we definitely need to dovetail solar with storage, otherwise uh, we'll have uh, problems. And then um, we'll look into utility scale cost, uh, as well as 
um, the issue of transmission lines, and then also the future of utility scale solar, um, with particular emphasis on uh, land use. And so utility scale solar, it, there's basically two kinds. There's the photovoltaic kind, and then there's the other kind, which is in the background. You see uh, it, it's called concentrated solar power. It's basically a bunch of mirrors that concentrate the sun's uh, energy uh, into a point uh, to heat. Um, a, like It's typically molten uh, salt that gets heated to a point. It's molten, uh, and that heat is used to then run um, steam turbines. So two flavors of utility scale solar, we'll dive into them a little bit more. On the photovoltaic side, um, the main thing that's been occurring in the utility scale solar space when it comes to photovoltaics is their use of larger and larger panels. And the reason for these larger panels is that labor cost is a major part of the cost of doing utility scale solar. And you can imagine that because you're not installing 20 panels, you're installing 20,000 panels. And so uh, it takes a lot of labor to install uh, that many panels. And if you can reduce those numbers uh, by even a little bit by using larger panels to achieve the same amount of energy generation, it translates into uh, big cost savings. And so then um, the panels are uh, deployable in a number of different ways. Um, one way is to install them in fixed tilt racks. Um, that is perhaps the lowest cost way of doing uh, of in, uh, deploying solar panels. Um, but one of the disadvantages of fixed tilt racking is that you're you're not able to tilt it with the seat to track of the seasons, and so as a result, uh, your jet energy generation is reduced. And so um, these utility scale deployments, they have to balance. Okay, well. Should I just, you know, negate the additional efficiency improvement of having some uh, uh, tracking uh, and therefore have lower cost of racking and that lower cost, you know, allows me to then perhaps, you know, have be able to sell this electricity to the grid uh, more cheaply or to uh, actually, you know, take those cost savings from racking to be able to install more panels. Uh, so that's always a calculus that is, um, you know, being made uh, in these installations. And you can see, see on the uh, graph on the right hand side, you know, we get a good amount of this fixed tilt deployment, uh, but, you know, a good amount of the, uh, well, the majority of uh, utility scale solar pursues single axis tracking. And so single axis tracking is um, panels that only tilt on one axis and they tilt to sort of track the sun, um, you know, as it goes through the sky. But really with single axis tracking, the main advantage of uh, single axis tracking is to be able to track across the season. So in the summertime, the sun is high in the sky. And so then it'll tilt to the face the sun high in the sky. And then in the winter time, the sun is lower in the sky. And so then it'll tilt down to uh, face the sun uh, at the lower angle. And so um, single axis tracking really doesn't make much sense uh, when you're going with smaller systems like residential or commercial scale solar. Uh, but when you have 20,000 panels or something, you know, humongous, uh, surprisingly, you can buy these single axis trackers in economies of scale, uh, uh, good to be able to bring down that price. Uh, so you can uh, make single axis tracking uh, make economic sense. And then there's also two axis tracking. Uh, and two axis tracking allows panels to both track uh, seasonally with the angle of the sun, but also across the day uh, as the sun tracks across the sky on a left right fashion. Um, but the two axis tracking really increases the cost of the um, mechanical tracking device. And so um, this is very uncommon. Uh, as you can see, like the, in a lot of these graphs, you, it's maybe like a slice a tiny slice if it even shows up on graphs at all. So, uh, but, you know, they do exist. And then there's also an increasing um, uh, interest in floating solar. Um, and this relates to land use and proximity to transmission lines, um, uh, which we'll talk about more later. Um, so oftentimes, uh, solar is really dependent 
on the economic viability of solar is really dependent on how close it is to available transmission lines that have capacity. And sometimes there's just not good land available uh, when you're near transmission lines. And so, uh, but sometimes there is a body of water available that's near transmission lines. And so um, floating solar panels is now, you know, really been popping off since uh, around 2019. All right, so the other type of solar uh, that's uh, being utilized in the utility space um, is concentrated solar power. And this is a type of solar that you never really see in residential or commercial. It's really only in utility scale. And the reason is because um, you can't scale this type of solar uh, technology down to a smaller scale. You have to go really big. Um, and they're very ca capital intensive. Um, and a lot of these were built uh, back in the day when the cost of photovoltaic panels were pretty expensive. Uh, but photovoltaic panels have dropped something like 90% in its price in the last like 20 years. And so as a result, um, these concentrated solar panel um, projects are not nearly as cost competitive as, their, uh, as, as the photovoltaic version. Um, but something to note about concentrated solar uh, power is that because they store the heat, like I said, uh, it's usually like a molten salt uh, solution that's super hot, it's five to 700 degrees. Um, and so this molten salt uh, stays hot even at night. And so the steam turbines that utilize this molten salt to generate electricity um, can operate at night too. And so these concentrated solar power projects have essentially energy storage uh, native to the technology. And so that energy storage has value in terms of energy. Um, energy actually, when we go into a future with a lot of solar, uh, being able to generate e uh, energy at night uh, will become very valuable. And so then this uh, technology that has energy storage kind of native and baked in um, is we could see a resurgence of this technology. Um, some things that you know hit the news media often regarding this concentrated solar power technology is bird deaths. Um, is simply because the the uh, the concentrated so solar energy is so so concentrated that if a bird were to fly into the path, um, they get uh, they get burned. Um, and but uh, in reality, the number of bird deaths from concentrated solar panels are very, very small compared to the number that die because of fossil fuels, uh, running into buildings, running into vehicles, or even being attacked by cats. Um, surprisingly, being attacked by cats is a, is a major source of bird deaths. And so, um, Something that we really need to think about uh, it, when we talk about, oh, well, you know, what is cheaper, residential solar, utility solar, you know, utility solar seems to be much less expensive um, because of economies of scale, which we'll, we'll show some graphs later. Um, but uh, when we start talking about that, the price of that en energy, whether it be residential or commercial solar, we need to think about what we're talking about, you know, because oftentimes when we talk about, you know, oh, solar is you know, this dollar per watt or this dollar per kilowatt. Um, what we're talking about is just the energy component. Um, but really the value of energy extends beyond um, the dollar per kilowatt hour. You also have to value capacity, uh, which is the maximum amount of energy you can produce at any one go. Um, you also have to mat uh, value dispatchability. So that hence like, that uh, reference to um, concentrated solar uh, power technology having, you know, that ability to generate at night or at a moment's notice um, versus if you have just panels, PV panels with no battery storage attached to it, then if it's not sunny uh, on a cloudy day or at night, you can't dispatch that energy because it's not being produced. Um, and so dispatchability has value. Um, reliability has value, stability has value. There's a lot of other kind of components to energy that we need to attach dollar values to. 
um, in, and think about that also. And, and when we think about where we put solar and what other kind of support uh, elements we attach with solar, whether it be batteries or molten salts, et cetera. And so uh, what is driving kind of the, the, uh, the, uh, the craze for um, installing a lot of solar um, at, at, and, and mass? Um, a lot of it has to be, it's actually driven by state mandates. Um, a lot of states have what's called renewable portfolio standards um, that you know have mandates for its utilities to to hit a certain amount of renewables by a certain date. Now, renewable these utilities can hit these requirements uh, by installing you know massive amounts of solar you know themselves in the form of utility scale solar. They can you know meet some of these standards by um, incentivizing you know you you know residential customers to install solar on your rooftops or incentivize commercial buildings to install solar on their roofs or parking lots. Um, but you know the, the the state standards really do drive a lot of um, it, it, the the push for renewables and uh, storage. So um, right now, you know, the, the, we we know the cost of solar panels has dropped by like ninety percent. It's now really inexpensive. The next frontier is to um, is in energy storage. You know, the question, the million dollar question is what technology can you know get us good efficient uh, storage at a price that is low enough that it's competitive on the uh, electricity grid market and um this is where uh, that it, um the the story at present is very interesting um on the right hand side is you know the current cost and projected cost of utility scale battery storage um, and as you can see then on the left, um, the energy storage solutions you can buy for your home's solar system is about the same price as what utility scale solar, uh, uh, utility scale battery energy storage is today uh, for the same technology. Um, and so this is really interesting uh, because, you know, on the solar panel side, we, we, we talked about how like, well, um, Utilities can buy, you know, 20,000 panels and be able to get them cheaper than maybe what you can get on your roof. Uh, but on the battery side, currently that story of scale, you know, increased scale, meaning resulting less cost, is uh, not quite there yet. Um, this story might change in the future, but right now, um, uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, you can buy batteries for about the same price as utilities can buy batteries. And uh, yeah, so here's the price of uh, utility scale solar. Um, the, on the right hand side, you see a comparison of utility scale solar versus on the two top two graphs uh, is, is the typical uh, projected costs for residential and commercial solar. Uh, they're projecting you know, that the, the, the cost that you can get solar on your roof for is about $2.71. Uh, a watt um, that in, that's and this is installed, so you know it's parts and labor, uh, and so utility scale can do it for less than half that, about a dollar a watt, um, and so this is great. But later in this presentation, we'll talk about okay the the role of transmission lines and this these costs here may not track into the future, um, and and we'll we'll talk about more about why. Uh, but right now, you know, this is the kind of stuff that gets pitched around. Oh, well, you know, um, utility scale is really cheap. Um, and then on the left-hand side is the graph that looks at the levelized cost of energy. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's just say, uh, you know, the solar panels are, have a design life of 25 years. Um, and then in that 25 years, each year, how much energy does it generate? Okay, so then now you take all that energy over the each year, multiply by 25, and then use that number to divide by the, the uh, capital cost, the first cost of installing that solar system. And so what, your, what, what, what the result is, is something called levelized cost of energy. And as you can see, and no matter whether it's residential, commercial, utility, that levelized cost is coming down and that cost, uh, that the, the cost decrease is 
as a result of um, better efficient panels, but really mostly driven by you know the huge drop in uh, first cost for uh, upfront cost for solar panels. Um, and you know it, it shows that again, utility scale solar can do it cheaper than residential solar. Um, but later I'll share with you uh, some some of the uh, facts about the state of the grid and and how that can change the landscape. And speaking of the grid, so how the grid works in the United States is that uh, we actually have three grids in the U.S. Um, and 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 so. The lower picture is a, a graphic of how that grid is separated. Um, here in Oregon, Washington, we're connected to, you know, basically the western half of the U.S. But if we were to generate energy and try to send it over to the East Coast, it would be very difficult because there's actually very few connections between these grids to be able to send power between them. Um, so they, they are cl pretty close to being separate grids. Um, and the graphic to the right of that is a, a, a is an analysis of all the transmission lines on the western grid, and the darker the uh, shade of red, it shows that those transmission lines are congested or they're at capacity. Often, you know, how often is that transmission line at capacity? And so. There's a good number of transmission lines that you know are already at capacity and frequently congested, and so therefore those transmission lines will not be able to accommodate more solar, even if you were able to you know build out a big utility scale solar uh, array next to that transmission line. The transmission line will not be able to accept that, and so that that's a problem. I mean, we and and the eastern side and the uh, Texas. Uh, grid also has similar graphics like this showing you know just how congested transmission lines are already and so when transmission lines are congested um, what they do is um, they start telling generating equipment on that line to start dialing it back because and and who has to dial it back is a very complex decision it's based on uh, cost to dial back that uh, generation. It is fact is the based on who can actually dial back. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you run a nuclear power plant, you can't just turn a knob and then have it magically reduce its generation like instantaneously. It doesn't work that way. Nuclear power plants are very slow to change. Um, they they don't like to change their output much at all. Um, it's a very finely tuned machine. <laughs> as you can imagine, um, whereas it is easy to actually tell solar inverters to dial back. Um, and so oftentimes uh, when utility lines, transmission lines are congested, they make decisions to tell certain generating uh, facilities to dial back. And solar has been hit with, you know, a lot of times uh, when the, uh, the transmission line is congested to dial back their outputs. And here's graphs for um, both the California and the uh, Texas grid. Um, how often, on which month, what percentage of the time the solar is being asked to dial back, and and this is not good. I mean, the when when you spent you know millions of dollars you know to install a huge solar array and you're not able to sell that power, instead you're being asked to dial back your output. Um, you know, that, that means that you're not making money. I mean, that you're, you're throwing away that energy. Um, but uh, we can't really solve this because, you know, like I said, the transmission line is at capacity. And so some folks want to build more transmission lines or upgrade transmission lines. Um, but th that's easier said than done. Um, there New transmission lines are very environmentally impactful. Um, for example, there is a new transmission corridor uh, in Maine that is uh, being built, but it's facing lots of uh, pushback from environmental uh, uh, advocacy groups and also um, landowners and the general public. Um, and it's not pretty to look at. Um, and the cost of these new transmission lines is also not cheap. Uh, we get various estimates that go from 700 billion to 
$2.4 trillion. And trillion is a big T. It's got 12 zeros attached to that. Um, and so really the, the question is like, can, do we have an alternative? Do we need to build those transmission lines? Um, and that is a decision uh, that you know you and I actually get to participate in making that decision because um, really uh, the 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 we in a previous talk you know I talked about we have enough parking lot space in cities we have enough box store roofs we have enough residential roofs um, and it's a product of you know so. American cities being sprawled out is not great. You know, in fact, uh, no other country other than the U.S. has as much single family sprawled out, you know, uh, cities and living way of living as the United States. Um, you know, lots of most other countries have much higher density cities. Um, but we we have sprawled out cities. But one of the great things about sprawled out cities is we have a lot of space on roofs and in between buildings to put solar panels. And um, later in the slide, I'll show that that is enough. Um, but right now, you know, the, the, the number of projects, utility scale projects that are wanting to come online is around 8,100 projects. And they're all sitting in line waiting for transmission lines to uh, open up so that they can then like implement their project. But, uh, so these 8,100 projects, if they had to pay for these new transmission lines and you know, at the cost of 700 billion to $2.4 trillion, um, these projects will no longer be uh, cost-effective and they will certainly not be as inexpensive as the graph about you know, the cost of levelized cost and first cost of utility solar, because uh, those projects um, that factored into that previous graph uh, didn't have to pay for new transmission lines or upgrades as part of their project cost. And so um, here, here's some stats about, you know, how much land do we actually need to power, you know, the, the energy needs of America? Um, so the, the story is that um, we need about 7% of the area of cities to supply every kilowatt hour in uh to be able to power you know our the the, the city um and then if you then take that to the whole united states it translates to about 0.4 percent of the area of the u.s and what does 0.4 percent look like about that much space and no the 10 million acres in this stat this uh, national renewable energy lab uh, stat 10 million uh, acres translates to actually like 15,000 square miles. So maybe a little bit bigger square. Um, but no matter whether it's 10,000, you know, a 10,000 mile square or 15,000 miles square, it, it's not that much space. Um, in fact, this is how land in America is divided. Um, we have a ton of space devoted to cows. <laughs> um, an insane amount of space devoted to cows. Um, so you would think, okay, well, we have, you know, not necessarily a land problem, but yeah, we do have a transmission problem and the land adjacent to transmission lines um, it, it is mo a lot of that land is bespoken for. Um, it's not that easy to uh, put solar panels next to transmission lines. Like think about this one, like look at this picture. Imagine they built the transmission line down this corridor. Well, directly adjacent to this transmission line is forest. And so where are you going to switch your solar panels? Uh, you're not. You're going to have to cut down a bunch of trees and be able to make space for that, those solar panels. Well, there's environmental uh, you know, barriers to cutting down all those trees to put solar panels there. Uh, so that's not happening. Um, and same thing with this picture, like this transmission corridor. You're not going to have adjacent space to put solar panels. And so that's the problem, like, you know, or, well, you know, even if, it, so there's a, the problem with transmission line capacity and then space directly adjacent to transmission lines is, uh, you know, not necessarily space that um, is conducent to uh, putting a big solar farm. Uh, but in the city, there is a lot of parking lots. There is a lot of roofs. There is a lot of box store roofs. Um, so that's why, you know, I, I think, you know, 
we could save the 700 billion to 2.4 trillion dollars and maybe dial those numbers way back so we do like and transmission line upgrade light you know a light upgrade um but then you know take those dollar savings and really invest in uh generation that is intermixed in the distribution system within cities and so you know the general public has to kind of weigh in okay well uh a add the cost of transmission lines but then also like start valuing um, energy for uh, capacity, dispatchability, forecastability, like, you know, uh, some of this stuff, dispatchability, forecastability, that means that you need to, if you're going to install solar on your roof, you're going to need to also buy batteries. Like, so then you need to add the cost of the battery onto your project, you know, onto your residential rooftop project if you want to value the dispatchability. Because right now, if you use net metering uh, with Pacific Power or uh, Portland General Electric, you're essentially using the grid as a free battery at night. It, and, and so then they have to you know, bear that cost. But uh, you know, then the, the, the electric utility can't bear that cost um, without having to invest in natural gas generators you know, or big batteries on their end. Um, and so, uh, they're bearing that value. Um, and what they're saying is that if we have to bear those resources, we need more transmission lines. Well, then there's a big cost to transmission lines. So then if the alternative is you have the batteries in your house, and then therefore you won't need that transmission line, and therefore that cost won't be needed to be distributed by all the rate payers. So, you know, that value needs to be considered. Um, and and so these are the common, like, you know, things that, you know, get valued when we talk about um, energy. But, you know, as we have this public discussion, you know, as more people think about this and weigh in on the value of energy, you can fill in the blank, you know, wh what else is not on this list that you value. And so that's kind of the conclusion of this is that uh, a utility scale solar has been really inexpensive. Um, but that's due to the fact that the so far up until this point, those projects have had you know access to transmission lines that they didn't have to build from scratch, and right now transmission lines are in hitting their limits, and so then the future cost of solar of utility scale solar will likely not be as cheap as the past experience, and so then moving forward, do we want to spend trillions of dollars or billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars on transmission? Or, you know, do we want to really double down on uh, solar and storage uh, within cities? So uh, that's kind of the, the, the um, presentation. And um, uh, we but have a good number of questions. Questions, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, questions. Can you not increase... Uh, Existing transmission line carrying capacity by increasing the wire size or adding more lines overhead of existing lines. Um, not inexpensively. So um, if you were to string new lines onto those um, existing uh, pylons, so th this structure is called a pylon, um, that's a very big expense. Um, these lines are actually extremely heavy um, and, to, uh, and, and pretty thick. Um, one of these wires is about the diameter of your arm. And um, so very expensive. Uh, and then you, it's not easy to add more lines because um, the, the, the weight of those lines, this pylon is designed for a certain weight. Um, and they, it's not just the dead weights, you know, on a calm day, they also need to handle all the wind loads, uh, on a very stormy day. Um, and then the lines have to be separated by a certain distance, uh, because these lines are actually not insulated. Um, they're bare wire. And so they're actually insulated by the insulator, which is this thing here, um, that the lines are attached to. And they're also separated by air. So that air is the insulating mechanism to keep them from short circuiting. Um, so not, not easy. Um, 
there, there are other ways to increase the transmission line carrying capacity. Some folks are interested in converting, uh, converting these lines from AC to DC. Uh, so on the ends of the transmission line, uh, if you were to go to high voltage DC, you can actually carry more energy on the same wire as uh, high voltage AC. Um, but the uh, upgrading the 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 um trans the what's it called the uh, transformers and power conversion devices on both ends and along the way though those are also very expensive upgrades as well um explaining the single axis graph again okay excellent yes so um the single axis trackers uh they 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 tilt along this pole here and so they're tilting only in this one single axis. And the when when they tilt, they track the sun, whether it's high in the sky in the summertime or low in the sky in the wintertime. And they're not able to then turn left and right to track the sun across the sky from morning to evening. Um, but that's fine um, because uh, being able to track the sun across the seasons uh, is plenty good enough um, for most utility uh, scale solar to gain that efficiency. Um, and as I said, uh, you, you can buy these trackers uh, at a low enough cost to be make it worth the cost of doing it and the efficiency gains you get uh, when you buy like 20 or 200,000 panels. Uh, but these single axis trackers, if you were to put them on your backyard, they're extremely expensive to buy one or two. Um, does that answer your question? If not, um, uh, feel free to ask a follow-up question. Um, and then also there's a question on underground transmission lines. Um, that is even more expensive. To, it's way more expensive to dig uh, a, a hole in the ground than it is to uh, take a helicopter to... Uh, deliver these pylons and drop them onto foundations and then use helicopters to string the uh, the lines. Um, that's the lowest cost way we know how to do this. Um, okay, well, that's all the questions. Uh, do you, is there other questions? Feel free to chime in. Thanks, Edward. I okay. Yeah. If talk. if not, there are no other questions. I want to put a plug in oh, for next uh, month's presentation. So it'll be the first, um, the first uh, Saturday of next month, and that will be March fourth. And the topic is kind of a follow up to this presentation, and the title is "Evolving Utility Customer Relationship," and um, we'll get into uh, that so what I mean by that is okay as more customers have are, are have the ability to produce energy on their premise, then they're no longer energy consumers. They are also energy producers, and so we actually have a term for that. It's called prosumer. <laughs> I don't know who coined that term, but it's gaining popularity. So being a, both a producer and a consumer, um, so that changes the relationship between utilities and the customer. Um, and uh, as, as I said, like in order to, in order to get dispatchability, forecastability, reliability, in order to get these things, the there's going to be needs to be there's going to be a need for more utility customer interactivity um, for in order to get those uh, other values of energy uh, to work and to keep the lights on. And the utilities have basically two options to do that right now. They have direct utility control, or they can implement an inform and motivate model. And um, so uh, there, there, there are some examples of this already. So like inform and motivate um, for Portland General Electric customers, there you have the option of peak time rebates, where you get a text message uh, or email, and maybe even a robot call to give you a call. Uh, to tell you what time next day 
uh, for how long to save energy. And so um, if you, you know, dial back your thermostat or do other means to save energy, uh, you can qualify for a rebate. Um, but that is a manual way of doing that. You have to, you know, read the text message and do something the next day at a certain time. There are ways to automate that through a protocol called Open ADR, and we'll talk about that. Um, the other way is um, like the utilities have run programs to like have you sign up for your thermostat to them or sign up your water heater to them, and then you know without your knowledge, whenever you know they have a need, they can press a button on their end and it'll automatically dial up or dial down your thermostat. Uh, to uh, save some energy on their end. And that's a, a, a example of this direct utility control model. Um, and the, the future is very undecided on, you know, which one is more consumer acceptable, uh, which is a better model. Um, and I'll explain more in this presentation, kind of the, the different uh, uh, elements. Um, okay, so we actually have a some time left and we also have a few uh additional questions that have come in uh so some additional questions what is the cheapest type of storage um that question is not that easily answered and the reason is because um some of the cheapest types of storage such as pumped hydro uh is certainly cheap but it's only cheap if you can have access to terrain um, that is a good fit for pump hydro. And so the amount of uh, suitable locations for pump hydro is very limited and they're pretty much tapped out. There's, there's not many new locations that can be identified uh, for pump hydro. Uh, so that is one very cheap type of storage. Um, and then there are other types of cheap storage that um, are cheap, but they are not, they have a, low round trip efficiency. So what I mean by that is if you put 100 kilowatt hours of energy to charge this storage device, you might only be able to get 50 kilowatt hours back out. The other 50 is lost. And so then is it it's cheap, but you know, it, with this poor round trip efficiency, is it really that cheap? Um so, you know, there those 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 like some caveats to think about. So um, that's batteries, uh, it's particularly lithium iron phosphate batteries or LFP batteries. Um, th that's the uh, slide I showed you. That's why I kind of earmarked that storage and I didn't share you know, all the other types of storage. Um, this, store, this type of storage has about like a 90% round trip efficiency. So you put hundred kilowatt hours in, you'll be able to get 90 kilowatt hours back out. So it's got very good round trip efficiency. And in the grand scheme of storage, it's pretty cheap. It's not rock bottom cheap compared to like pump hydro, uh, but it's pretty cheap. And the other advantage of uh, this type of storage as battery storage, it's very scalable. You can go from, you know, having a rack in your house to, you know, whole shipping container size racks and multiple of them that, that are on a substation to be able to power, you know, whole neighborhoods. Um, so the scalability factor is also something that um, needs to be taken into account. Okay, and then there's another question. What is keeping cities from installing widespread solar? That is a good question. Um, one is, uh, I, I think it's the, the, the cost of doing solar um, right now when there's not a lot of people doing it together each project is a one-off project. And so there's a lot of costs associated with, you know, um, keeping a company alive in between orders or in between jobs uh, so that those, those costs, you know, remain, you know, something that is annoying to a solar business. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, I, I would say that's kind of the main thing. Like, you know, if we were to like, you know, uh, have a big campaign to like, you know, do a big group buy on solar panels and batteries and inverters uh, that would really, you know, reduce the, the cost. Um, and then the other, perhaps the other thing is also, um, you know, for a long time, you know, 
a lot of places have net metering. And so you didn't need to install batteries. You can just install solar. Um, but net metering is going away. And you know, in a previous uh, presentation, I talked about why that's going away. Um, and because that it really boils down to the value of energy. Um, that value of energy is not constant. Uh, you know, and so if you actually account for the true value of energy, the, including its dispatchability and being able to be used at night and cloudy days, then um, you really need to include those costs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th that's kind of the, the, the main reasons for cities not being widespread. But I mean, I, I think as batteries and solar gets cheaper and then as we also get, you know, more skilled labor uh, to install solar um, and then also policy changes to um, enable more people to be able to install solar without having to go through like a four year, you know, licensing and apprenticeship journeyman process just to be able to you know install solar panels because like i don't really see a need to be like a full you know uh electrician to be able to install solar solar is very plug and play um oftentimes those connectors are so are designed so that you don't ever touch any like bare wire conductor you can just like plug plug them into each other with the insulator um cap and so i mean it's very safe um, but the policy has not caught up with the technology uh, of solar. And so there's still a requirement that, you know, uh, to do the wired connections, you need to be a full journeyman, you know, uh, you know, uh, electrician. To, and that really bottlenecks the number of people that are able to install solar. And that increases the labor cost and increases the, uh, the, the timing and, you know, the wait times to get solar. All righty. Um, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, if there's any more that are coming in, feel free to ask. But uh, with that, uh, maybe we will close this presentation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Great. And Thanks, hope, Edward. Hope, yep. I hope you guys all have a great Saturday. You too. Bye. Okay. Yep. Thanks.